Thanks. Welcome. Welcome everybody to Pure Dog Talks live at five. I am your host, Laura Reeves, and I am super excited for all of you guys to join us. And we're talking about Mother's Day, sort of doggy style, right? So we have Dale Martinson of Touche Japanese Chin here with us. And we're going to talk about our doggy moms, our foundation bitches, our dams from pre-breeding through the litter, after motherhood, all of that sort of thing. So I'm very excited for everybody to come join us today. And meanwhile, while everybody's hopping on, we have a couple items for the good of the order. And in case you haven't heard, and I know if you guys come to the lives often, you've heard this one, but I'm, I'm really excited about it for anybody who hasn't joined us. We have recently launched a very cool new opportunity to access our archives. And I've done all the searching and hunting and packing for you. Um, and for the low, low introductory price of only a buck 99, you can download entire albums that are sorted by topic. So things like breeding and whelping hands on the interviews where we talk to the legends of the sport veterinary voice, which is, um, four years worth of conversations with Dr. Marty Greer, uh, talking about owner handlers, various of our love the breeds episodes where we highlight specific breeds, a lot of rare breeds in there, all kinds of stuff. So as always, our success is your success. If you haven't yet, please do check out our exclusive patrons group. The patrons group is available for folks who are willing to support the show with a small monthly contribution. And we've added some extras to this. We have the pure pep talk, which is a weekly text message, just has a fun, upbeat sort of archived information. Um, the private Facebook group that provides community, which is something that we think is largely missing in a lot of our, our purebred dogs today and our dog sports. So we have that available, all of this for as little as 10 months, 10 bucks a month. So, I mean, you can spend that on a coffee drink and the more you spend, the more access you get. So we have retreats, we have all kinds of fun things that we do with the patrons. So really looking forward to having you all join us there. Bottom line, your passion, that's our purpose. So you can check it all out on the website at puredogtalk.com. So now let's get this party started. Yay. Welcome, Dale. How are you doing today? Great, Laura. It's so good to see you. I, you know, you and I talked so much for a while, and I feel like we just haven't had the chance. And when I decided to do this topic. I'm like, I got to bring Dale in. This is amazing. <laughs> well, you know, the, your, your breeding girls are the backbone of any program. And I mean, you know, like you always say, the boys get credit, but the girls do the work. It, it is true. And, and, you know, we can, we can have a little, you know, women's suffragette here, but <laughs> It's, it's true in our dogs, even more than it is in, in our own lives. So talk to us, Dale, you've, you've produced what, 500 some odd champions over the course of your years, breeding dogs and yep. talk to us about kind of a process, how you do with your girls, starting from when you're getting them ready to be bred, deciding if they're going to be bred moving through the breeding process and then talking about how do we work with our girls after they're finished with their breeding career? Do we decide to keep them? Do we decide to rehome them? Some of those kinds of questions. I think there's an awful lot to cover here. Folks out there in the audience, if you have any questions, by all means, drop them into the comments on Facebook. Natalie, my dear and beloved producer, will bring them to us here so that we can discuss them for you. So talk to us, Dale, what do you think? Well, I think the basis of any successful program is the core set of bitches that you're breeding. 
and it's not necessarily show dogs. Some of them might not ever right. make it into the show ring at all, but they may have the strength, the productivity, and the hallmarks of the breed. But productivity is so important and so oftentimes lost because we've gotten so good at making non-productive animals work. And we can really end up going down a rabbit hole where we're sabotaging our own progress. Once you start doing the above and beyond the supportive care to the extra repo stuff to, to, to get to make those top show winners now produce, then your program is going to suffer in the long term. Because those really good foundations. So Dale, talk to me. The the really good foundation is what I want to talk about. And you and I have touched on this in the past, but I really want you to draw this out for me because it's so important for me. When we look at using a bitch in the breeding program, it's not just she's pretty, it's not just she's sound, it's not just she has a good mind. Does she get pregnant? Does she stay pregnant? Can she whelp her puppies? Can she raise her puppies? And and four months after those puppies are weaned, is she ready to do it again? Because mm. that is the biggest thing. If your your female should come through having that litter, raising that weaning and weaning that litter, and she should be needing a diet by the time she's done. She should come off of there thriving and looking beautiful and radiant. I mean, if your mother dogs look like they are um, refugees, that's a problem. They, they I've had a few that looked like they might have been Dachau refugees when they were done they, all skin and bones and hair falling out. <laughs> and those, when you, and really and truly, when you start in when people say, how do you know what is in your dogs? It's because you are working with a core set of bitches. And then you'll add stud dogs into those bitches. But you really don't, you think long and hard before you add into those bitches. Because that is, that's, when you're, when you've got really good bitches, your stud dogs are all top producers. You know, because. Yes. They just show up for a. And that's and I think Dale, I think that's so important what you just said. And it's you know, it comes through in Pat Trotter's book, it comes through in any of the any of the really smart people you talk to, your best stud dogs are out of really great bitches. Really great bitches. And like I say, not necessarily show bitches, but really great bitches. Oh, uh, we had a little chin bitch that produced sixteen champions. You know, doing it at like three at a time, you know, four at a time. And she had best in show winners. She had national specialty winners. And, you know, that she very quietly made the whole kennel. And everything it was, you know, and wonderful health, lived long and healthy with no issues. And you can do so much with that because you have so much information with what that bitch is giving you as far as defects, qualities, shortcomings, all of that, which you should keep very careful records of. And then when you go yes. and breed up big time best in show winner and you get something out of the norm, you go, oh, that didn't come from here. You know, because you know what. Came. Right. And, and Dale, you make such a really good point, not only about keeping records, but really knowing what our bitches produce, right? When I look at my wire hair pointers and I have a direct bitch line from my foundation bitch and every single litter that I've bred has been a direct descendant down from that bitch. I brought in, and this is we've talked about this before. I brought in a second bitch line because I wanted to add some diversity and, you know, some of that kind of stuff. And that brought a whole nother set of, of complications. Right. And so, you know, talk to us about that and talk about 
right. How do you decide? Like, I've got this really pretty little bitch um, and she's a great show dog, but I just can't get puppies out of her. Where's your line? What do you make your decisions well, on? That's really a good question because, you know, when, when we started with our Japanese chin, um, I had went to go, I had a best in show winner. Somebody gave me that I put a best in show on, not even really knowing anything about the breed. And I went to go buy a bitch and I was going to go buy a champion bitch. And I looked at her and I thought, well, she's not standing on very good legs. And, and the breeder had something that ran and got underneath her couch that we, and I said, was that a chin too? And she's like, well, yes. <laughs> and so with help of her husband and son, we tipped the couch over and we got her. And, um, I paid two hundred dollars for, her. but she was a wonderfully sound, healthy, beautiful, free whelping bitch. Produced my first homebred best in show winner, and and nine <laughs> other champions. But wow, not a but a good dog. That's mm -hmm. the big. It doesn't have to be a show dog, but it has to be a good dog. Would people want this dog? Would this be a great family dog? Would this dog be great for what its purpose is? And that's what you want in your in your foundation and you want to add to. So, I mean, you can take her and show her, but that doesn't mean you should breed her because every show dog is <laughs> not. And so, and so that's what I'm saying. Give us, give us your, must haves and never haves. So for me, if I saw a dog go run and hide underneath a couch, I wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole, right? <laughs> because in my breed, I need a dog that's going to stand up, right? Right. So I want a dog that has, that has smart eyes. I want a dog that is, you know, that is like looking at you and you think to yourself, well, that's a cool dog. Cause it, and it's seeing you, I want a dog with really good skin and clean ears. I don't mess with mm -hmm. bad ears. I, I don't like bad skin. Anything, anything, that's a terrible thing to get started in. And it's, it's something that will, will be tracked through all of your dogs. So, you know, I want a dog that's a good eater. If I have to do extra things, I mean, we're all on a diet here. Yeah. Good. Honestly, that is so smart. They'll, and the other one, stud dogs, right? Like somebody was telling me about, they just bred to this stud dog, really good friend of mine, very, very smart, talented, Basinji breeder, bred to this outside of her line stud dog and the puppies don't eat. She's like, what, what do you mean they don't eat? <laughs> so, so that is such a smart point that I think has to be taken into consideration and you tell me your experience but my experience is that's genetic <laughs> all genetic and if you have a breed that has uh has like um uh, you know facial markings and stuff i don't like any breed any dog that has wet eyes you know so i mean like whether you're whether you have a, a maltese a cavalier japanese chin mm -hmm. you know, if, if you're having to do mm -hmm. things to get rid of eye stain that's not something you want to add into your dogs. You know, it needs to start out being a sound found. I think the whole thing about the, the whole thing about when you talk about foundation, the foundation of the house is not the woodwork and it's not the pretty flowers on the porch. The foundation is what you build from and you need to start out with strength, dependability. You need to have something that you feel confident in. And that you can do, then you can go ahead with your exciting stuff on top of that. But you start out with a good fancy dog. striped curtain. Exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I and I think that's so important. And I think back to my foundation bitch, who that's exactly what she was. I mean, in my breed and where I heard pointers, I need a bird dog that's got a great mind, that stands up. She was not fancy. She wasn't super pretty. She had a straighter front than I would have liked, but she was a hell of a little show dog. And she came to me at like six months old. My mom had had her 
and I'm just messing with her a little bit and I'm playing with her and I back her up and she jumps backwards and lands in a perfect free stack, tail wagging, head up, ears up. And I'm like, oh yeah, I can work with this. <laughs> well, right? I can I'll, add hair. I can, I can do some things. I'll tell you, I look for those dogs as, as a breeder and as a judge, even sometimes, sometimes, you know, I had an exhibitor show the same dog to me probably five times. And one day she wasn't the fanciest dog, but she you know, like day the fifth time she was the best dog. And she stood there and like, there was a noise came over the loudspeaker and everybody else was scrambling and hitting the floor. And she stood there and held her sack and held it. It's like going, well, today, girly, you're winning. And you know, I mean, and that is yeah. more important than hair. That's more important than flash. That's your foundation. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, yeah. sometimes that doesn't always get rewarded in the show ring, but it should be what the breeders want because every generation of pick of litter bitches, your dog should get better because you're picking the best. And so by the time you're five, six generations into your program, well, you should have some hellacious good dogs. And you should also yeah. be keeping in mind, what am I having to do? Is my work getting more or less to raising these puppies? Am I having more or less, you know, you know, uh, quality? Am I having you know, more defects? You know, and you can kind of like see different directions that maybe you might go, mm, I'm not going to go back that way because you have that yes you have that yeah i think that that's an important um thing to to bring up and to talk about a little bit kind of hold it out here and wave it around um we talked about what's what you're looking for what are you going to be like okay i bred her and i'm never breeding her again I know what it was for me. I had a bitch that just, she wasn't thrifty. She didn't eat. She didn't want to whelp. She was a terrible, like all of it. And she had beautiful pedigree and beautiful litter of puppies. And I just marched her off to a lovely pet home because I can't, I can't, if it's, if it's harder, if I'm working harder to raise the 13 puppies than she is, then we have a problem. Yes, absolutely. And you want because it's not just that one bitch it's the totality of the litter mm -hmm. and it's everything in there i'm one time we bought a beautiful dog and he was probably one of the the most beautiful cockers i'd ever shown and he won an all breed best in show from the classes which i had never done before oh, wow. pretty pretty good way to finish mm -hmm. and um but he was from an undershot mother and he was the only puppy in his litter of seven that had a good bite. And he produced about 75% bad bites, which was a total deal breaker. You know, wonderful show dog, no value as a breeding animal. And, and you know, it's like, so that's like, best that time into to breeding bitches with those fundamental faults then you're just going to get it over and over again because you're going to it's going to tempt you back in with that one pretty puppy right and you're then you're off showing it and you start winning and next thing you know your ego gets in the way of your better sense mm -hmm. oh my goodness that that never happens dale i don't know what i don't know what you're talking about <laughs> I think that was sarcasm for anybody who is very brave breeders to share yeah. because then they share yeah. what they're doing. Yeah. And I think that that is again, something that we see less and less of, and it's a shame because that kind of fundamentally working together when we don't have a way, most of us to have a hundred dogs in a kennel, it's the only way we're going to get moving forward in a breeding program. Yes, I think that the other thing is that when somebody does open their door to you, be a good house guest, take your shoes off and yes. you don't, and you know, and when you have things come up, don't have a big, you know, I mean, 
you know, go ahead and accept that and don't make a big deal out of it and decide what you can and can't live with and then go forward from there. Be someone that people want to work with because everybody's wonderful when it's all going great. You know, when when it's all going terribly bad, that's when you decide uh, whether you're going to ever have anything to do with these people ever again. Yeah, that's a thing. Um, okay, so we've decided which bitch we're going to breed. Now let's talk about Mother's Day. We're in the whelping box. How are we? What are some of your top five tips? We've done some of this before, but we're doing it live now. Top five tips for in the whelping box. What was the one I saw the other day that made me think about calling you? Something about um, cookies, oatmeal cookies. Oh. <laughs> I was like, no way, dear. So it's all about comfort and it's all about, it's all about, you know, when everything is going good and every, and when they're feeling good, things are happening good. And so, so we want to go ahead and make this, the birth birthing process as low stress as possible. So if you have a dog that is going to have to possibly have a cesarean section or any dog could, but if you have a higher probability, mm -hmm. then you need to pinpoint your breeding dates by using progesterone. You know, because if you do a surgical insemination, you can plan on a C-section. You know you can have all of that, have all of your emergency plan in place before you breed the bitch. Not when yeah. being there with yes. your dog. And, Not yeah. at, yeah, 63 and a half days. That's a bad time. <laughs> Bad time to make a new relationship. Yeah. The uh, and then you know, once you have set up, like I have my kitty pool set up in the living room right now uh, with a little X pen around it because we're going to have puppies tonight because I ran the progesterone and I know she's going to be in the window. So you know, planning. Look at that, you guys. We have Facebook Live with puppies. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, let's see if I. Oh my god! Let's see. Uh, All right. right, let's see. Wait, wait, right wait. Maybe. Yeah, there we go. Puppies. I love yep. it. <laughs> so you have that plan in place. Have no. Have all of your stuff there. Have your. I think you have your little aerator machine running over there in the corner. Yep. So if you need to resuscitate, yep. you have all of your things in hand. So you know what you're doing and you can offer a safe, fast experience and kind of know what your parameters of your breed are. You know, is your is your breed one that's going to have babies and it's no big deal if it's two or three hour break in the middle of it? Or is your breed one that if it doesn't have the babies about every 45 minutes, you need to be on your way into the vet? You know, knowing where you are on yes. that. I keep oxytocin and doprum on hand, you know, along with your expressor bulb. Just have all of your all of your wool whelping kit needs to be ready in advance. Planning yep. makes the, everything happen. Healy catheter. Pardon? Yes, and 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 that's it. We have we have Pure Dog Talk has a whole list of whelping supplies. Revival has a list. Everybody's got a list. Make sure you've got all the lists. Get them checked off. Have Absolutely. what you need on hand ahead of time. And then as you're going through the process, your your tip that you had um, was for oatmeal cookies because you were um, to have milk come in. I use fenugreek. I feed oatmeal and yogurt and cottage cheese to my bitches. But talk a little bit about that because I thought that was super cute. Well, so so the, the the oatmeal, like in toy breeds, especially when especially when you have nursing bitches, when they're cleaning those puppies dutifully, that can really make their stomach go off, because the the smaller the dog, the less intake there, are. and so they can go get a sour stomach cleaning too many puppies, and so and they can like mm -hmm. a little bit lose the desire to be sitting there eating. So the cookies. Uh, has a little bit of sugar to it, which is going to spike their appetite a little bit. It's going to entice them a little bit. You're got, you've got some uh, protein coming from carbs, not just 
you know, and this is going to help bind up and make a better stool because sometimes your, your BMs on, on uh, nursing uh, mothers can be a little bit, have a little something to do be desired. Intestinal health is everything. One thing, one thing that's really a, a neat trick um, is if you do have a cesarean section and you're bringing your bitch back from the vet and you're doing that introduction because you don't leave, she just doesn't wake up with puppies. That's a no-go. You, you have, she has to be come through all having had the babies and then you are going to have the introduction period and you're going to let her come to room temperature uh, slowly with them. But one thing that really helps take a baggie along and you're going to get some looks, uh, but bring a placenta or two home from your section, bring it home. Don't forget it in your car. It's a bad thing to find two to three days later, but, take it put it that's a bit in it. texas particularly pardon in texas particularly oh my gosh yeah, hot no. hot weather yeah, hot not not a good thing not a good thing but it will help your bitch's milk come in it'll help her hormones come in it'll make her have feel like she's mm -hmm. had the whelping process and she will feel much more natural to those puppies mm -hmm. You know, uh, one mm -hmm. thing to kind of always watch too is um, make sure, especially on those section bitches, that you've got the cords looking the way you want them. Because if they're too long and they start worrying on them, that can be a thing too. Make sure that you have everything set up for her yeah. and that, that it's like a calm, you're calm, you know, and she's calm, everything's calm. And we're going to bring these babies in and have, have a, a beautiful meeting process. As my bitches whelp, I pull the puppies. I don't leave them with the mothers as they whelp. That they're not at their finest. Yeah. No. So I have a Well, uh, and uh, I mean, think about this, Dale. Imagine imagine a wire hair pointer with 13 puppies. And so you're trying oh. to get puppy number 13 out, right? Okay, now go there what? in your mind. Trying to get puppy number 13 out, and there's 12 of them crawling around. I mean, like it's not a thing. Right? So when you have contractions, if you're doing this, at, at, you know, with a free well, when you have contractions, move the puppies to their separate box with their heating pad. Get, Absolutely. get mom, get the puppy out, get it cleaned up, get it nursing. Then Make you can put puppies back in because, the, yeah, the, the nursing actually helps stimulate contractions. You know, so it's not like you never want the puppies in there, but during active whelping labor, get the puppies out of the way so nobody gets squished. Exactly. And make a note that if it, the puppy comes with or without the placenta, and because that's that's kind of one of those little open book tests, you're going to need to know where all of our placentas are and whether or not, you know, I mean, whether you give your own oxytocin or not, you're going to want to make sure that they're all accounted for, you know, and make sure that we got the percent. That's where those um, little grippy gloves or sometimes uh, a paper towel works good to slowly work it out. I mean, uh, our first thing is to, to get the puppy and get the, get the bag off its head. Uh, but, you know, try to be mindful and call methodical about that. And once you get the bag opened up, See if you can get that placenta out without breaking it off. It's 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 a big plus. Yeah. 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 Hundred percent. At just cleaner and neater for starters. <laughs> oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah. That that's that's a that's a, a really that's a, a nice a nice thing to you know to kind of keep track of and and like I say you know. I'll usually let them, like on the Cavalier or Cocker, I'll let them eat two or three of them. You know, if you go too much more than that, yeah. you're going to have a really good puke. Um, and so that's that's highly over. I don't recommend that. It's, you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm good with one. After that, I'm like, all right, you got yours. <laughs> We're just going to take care of these. I, I Wire hairs can get some really bad intestinal intestinal health is important yes so, so it's i mean these are the kind of things you guys out there in listener land 
you're not necessarily going to know if this is a new bitch to you or a new breed to you. And so this is where mentors are so important. I have sat with people on the phone through 12 hours worth of whelping 13 puppies, you know, call me, text me, whatever. I mean, that's the kind of thing that you really do need to have. It, it just makes it so much easier when you've got backup and help and, and someone with the knowledge of the breed. Part of your records you're keeping, you're going to pay uh, attention to see how does she do with her babies? Does she take the bag off? Or does she drop them and walk away like that? They're not not her problem. I mean, this is because if she does it the first time, she's probably going to do it the second time. So you, that's my that might yes. not be the one to leave to, on um, uh, you know, unattended when it's getting close. So those are things you want to make note if how thick the sacks are and whether they're born outside the sack or not. Some of them will have double sacks if the sack mm-hmm. is terribly thick. Yeah, it's not a good sign. That's that's probably going to be a problem. You know, if your puppy's born and the tongue is out of its mouth, that puppy's dead. We there, don't don't spend a lot of time lamenting that. Move on to acceptance quickly. Uh, the uh, you know, tend to the living. That's where you can make a difference. Yes. You know, but you know, like I say, try to avoid doing. The wonderful sling them down between your your knees thing, it's just highly overrated. Don't do that at all. Please don't do that. Everybody has a story. Don't do it. How they don't do it. Room. Just, just leave that leave that out. Just use the expressor bulb. Far less traumatic and it's safer. Or the Dealey catheter. Marty, Marty Greer is a huge advocate for the Dealey catheter. If you've gotten one, they're super cheap. They're super easy. I personally can't use it. It makes me throw up. But <laughs> no matter what, <laughs> use, use, use something. Do not swing your puppies. Do not swing no. the puppies. Okay. Sunny has a question for us. Are you x-raying bitches prior to whelping to determine how many puppies to expect? Yes, 1,000%. Dale? You know, it just depends. If, if It, it kind of depends. I mean, if you, if you have the schedule time available, I mean, it's a sure nice thing to do when you're doing a free whelp because you know when you can go to bed, uh, you know, but you have to, you have to wait. This, the x-ray has to be far enough along that they can really tell. If you rush on in there much before 45, 50 days, uh, you still don't know. So, you know, if you're going to do it no, by you can't, all- 50, 57, yeah. 57, 58 days, I think is what my vet likes. And I won't do it before then because you can actually get some damage to the puppies. Um, Sunny, so in answer to your question, Dale's a sometimes, I'm an always, and I'll tell you why, probably the difference. Dale has Japanese chin and Cavaliers. They have three or four puppies. I have wire hair pointers. They have 13. So I really need to know what I'm working with. And um, I will tell you in large litters, um, the last litter, I wire hair pointer litter, I personally whelped. I was x-rayed with, the bitch was x-rayed with 11 puppies. <clears throat> and 11 puppy number 11 comes out and we call him finale and then we give her the oxytocin shot and out comes three more and it was like no no so x-rays are not always a hundred percent remember that remember that you always are gonna find value i believe in using your oxytocin yeah. um to make sure that you've cleaned out placentas extra puppies say again dale I said, the more information you have going into it, the better off you are. I've had very little luck with ultrasounds. I'm sure there have been people that have ultrasound stuff. Uh, the numbers on ultrasounds are never as accurate as x-rays for me. And my, you know. I, I do an ultrasound. Is she pregnant? Is she not pregnant? I'm not trying to count puppies, right? That's all I'm doing. And, and it's... I mean, honestly, if I just sit there for another week, I know she's pregnant or not pregnant, (laughs) but I'm one of those. I'm like a, I'm a, I'm like a Nancy gotta know. (laughs) 
one nice thing is like first progesterone you can really time your 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 whelps and you should keep track of yeah. what number that bitch whelps at because sometimes like a japanese chin she'll be yeah. having baby at a two and that uh, cavalier she'll go down 1.5 you know before she even starts so make yeah. that a note on your whelping chart yeah how far will drop you know because they're all a little bit different That's a, I did not have not had the opportunity to do enough reverse progesterone to test that. That's kind of interesting. So, all right. So we've got our puppies on the ground. We raise our puppies up. We do a great job. We decide yes or no, she's, she's staying in the program. What do we do going forward with our moms? We've, we, do you do back to back or do you skip cycles? How do you handle it? Curiosity. Uh, I know what I do. What do you do? I think, and, and. And you know, haters gonna hate, but I think that uh, skipping cycles on bitches is humanization of the dog breeding process. I think that my bitches have babies when they're two, three, four, and by the time they're five, they need to be done. They need to be on somebody's lap. So mm -hmm. those are their breeding years. Mm -hmm. You breed them if you possibly can. It is not doing them a favor, in my opinion, letting them sit like a coffee pot without water in them. I don't think that that's like saving them. It's not saving their eggs. I mean, if they have if they have problems uh, staying in condition through whelping and weaning, then they have problems. But good brood bitches should be able to have back to back litters. Get your puppies out of them while they're young. Young mothers bounce back faster. They have better puppies. They're easier to work with. And then, because we're not hoarders, we don't hoard. And we're moving forward. Place her before she's 100. Yeah. And put her where she can be a nice, vibe family dog for a long time. And somebody will want her and she can have, she'll have done her part. And when she's five and spade, she's right. She's back. You know, but but that you know mm -hmm. that's the thing yep. is don't be greedy. Right. I you know I tell you what I was early on in my breeding years I was very much in the skip a season you know blah 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 it's mean it's terrible, and then my my um, repro vet here actually here in Grants Pass said to me the thing that stayed with me the longest, a pregnant uterus is a happy uterus in the dog. They're designed to be pregnant. Yes. Yes. And they and should be so pregnant. And I, so I have gone to, yeah, I've gone to back to back and then decide, am I breeding her again? Maybe I'll skip a litter or skip a season and then do a final litter. I don't breed my bitches more than three times, just me in the big breeds. That's plenty of puppies for her to produce into the gene pool. That's enough. I don't need more than that out of any bitch. One thing that we have found, uh, because when you're talking about cesarean sections, is you have to worry about adhesions. And uh, we have a mm -hmm. phenomenal yep. vet uh, shout out Dr. Mills, you're great, and who sound, found by uh, taking furacin on the, the sections on the uterus after they've sewed them up, that that inhibited the overhealing. And so part of that, because those adhesions are a problem, they, they're a problem for conception. Oh, yeah. They're a for, for pile, they're just a problem. So it, it, another thing is, if you're sectioning your bitch, breed her every time. The last one, take take the uterus out with them. You know, so I mean, that's that's a, you know, some people don't like to do that. You that know, some people that want to one I'm a little, yeah, I, yeah, that because there's I've been there. I had a bitch that on her last litter torsioned a uterine horn, right. Mm -hmm. And so we had to do the C-section and I said, that's it. We're not doing it again. Just spare. Well, we almost lost her because they're so vascularized at that point that 
particularly in the larger breeds. Yeah, we almost lost her very close to bleeding out. And even with, even though we saved her in the, in the um, spay, he missed a chunk of ovary <laughs> because there was this big bloody mess. And so the bitch had no uterus, but she came in season every year <laughs> because of this tiny little floating piece of ovary. Yeah. So I have, I have gone oh. away from that. I have decided um, because of that experience Say yeah. that again, Dale. We don't spay them with our sections because I think it jacks with their milk production. But they're but also aware that a lot of breeders, gosh, they're paying two and three, four thousand dollars. Or so. I mean, I know that there is econ. You know, I mean, you know, in case you're not don't have a trust fund, I understand. You know, there is a, there there does there does enter in a monetary something in there as well. So, I mean, you kind of, but personally, I would rather go ahead and wean them off and have, you know, and do it later. But because I think it's, I think you have a more natural wean. I actually just, yes. And I actually like to have them go through a whole nother heat cycle and then spay them. So that's how I've got, I've got one right now that a Spinoni bitch that just had her last litter. She just came out of season. She's getting spayed next month. Right. So that to me, it seems to be the safest and healthiest avoids Pio lets them get all their home hormones all settled. And then we can move on from there. Perfect. That's a th big thing. You have to get with your breed mentors and because they're going to tell you, what things are different about your breed than another breed. And that's because it's not one size fits all. And so you've got to figure out what works for this breed may not be. Really not. Um, oh, Amber, I'm very sorry. Lost her foundation girl to a C-section spay. So, yeah. That's I, I, like I say, Amber, I was, I was so close and that bitch was incredibly, incredibly special, incredibly important near and dear to my heart. Um, and, and if I had lost her in that, I would have been a mess. So yeah, it's, um, talk to us about, and I think this is important. Um, you just made the point a little while ago, Dale the not being hoarders like you and i have had this conversation on the podcast and i think it's it's a hard conversation for some people to hear and so i want us to to, to say it now here in front of god and everybody finding these retired moms a good home is not an evil horrible no good bad thing to do it is the best thing for the dog it's for the dog. It's for your program. It's for the. It's for these families that maybe can't afford a puppy, or they can't do a puppy, but still would be a great home. This is, and it's a great way to be able to monitor that bitch's health throughout the rest of her life. And so, what we do is we started a program where we called it for mom. And when we sell a puppy, we ask our folks. Would you be interested in her mom when she retires? Because everybody has a soft spot for mom and we all put up with an extra amount of love from our moms. And even if it makes us want to run out in traffic. And so by going out there and having a person say, we're going to get Muffin's mom, they're going to be extra tolerant. Her. And like my breeds are communal breeds. So they do really well going into a home where they have one of their own little species and they're going to fall right in line and they've got the other dog there with them to kind of fall. It, it's such a seamless transition and it's so positive. There's just nothing negative about this. The biggest mistake breeders can make is having too many dogs from someone who's had too many dogs and probably does now. I don't know. But the big thing is you want to take. Nobody's counting. Pardon? 
That's right. That we're not counting nobody's them. counting, Dale. Yeah, but the important thing is, is you got to get those dogs so you can keep moving your program forward. Move that program forward. Sitting there and I hear people doing repeats over and over and over. What is that doing for your program? Nothing. I mean, you're you're if you have Nothing. a, a big, you need to do think outside of the box. Think two generations ahead. And you to be able, or, or three, better yet, mm. uh, to be able to go ahead and do that. But you've got to keep your numbers down. And I don't care how dedicated, how much you love them. If you're going off to shows and you're training puppies and you're keeping back the next ones, it's going to divide your time. It's going to divide your space and it's going to divide your finances. You know, where, you know, where, that, where that, that female can then go be one of two dogs rather than one of 10 or 20, you know, it's a better deal for her. And yep. it, it's so much financially yep. better for your, your kennel. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, it's, it's like, that's a bad mistake. I have, I have one old well, myself and one other old dog right now. That is the only old dogs we have. And, you know, but I just don't like to see that happen where you have dogs that have spent their whole life in the kennel. Because after a certain point, they don't rehome. And that's in my No. And, you know, the other thing about it, Dale, you said the part, even if they're not kennel dogs, you know, even if they're just in the house and crate and rotate, they're still not getting the same attention if they're one of 20 that they would be getting if they're a single or one of two or three. You know, going into a home with a family where the people do stuff and they'll take, I mean, my bitches have gone off, got their field titles, done all kinds of, the, the one I told you that was not a great brood bitch, she's going to go show in veteran sweeps with her new owners. She's spay, who cares, right? So, I mean, they have great lives that, that you aren't responsible for maintaining on your own. Right. And they're such a wonderful ambassador of the breed. And they're going to bring people in. They're going to bring people in to, they want to, people want to know why the Labradoodles and Golden Doodles and every Schnoodle Doodle is so popular. Well, it's because we are not taking the opportunities to promote our purebreds as great dogs. And when you hear about breeder dogs, then all of a sudden they become rescues. And it's not a rescue. It's a rehome. It is a placement. And it's, it's a benefit to everybody. And it's just the only really responsible thing to do. Because as we get older, as they get older, it takes more to keep it up. It, you know, there's more dentals, there's more this, there's more that. You know, and someone's going to do better with a home with, with two dogs. You know, it's just a fact. It is. It is a fact. And, you know, I mean, over the course of years, there have been two or three of my old dogs that were just too near and dear to me that, yes, they stayed in my house. You know, they yes. died in my house. But I'm yeah. going to be legit. Not every dog that I kept and bred and showed and did things with died in my house. They really didn't. No, I, I've considered it a failure when they do because they missed out on getting to go be a pet. And, you know, and as much as we yeah. think that, you know, we're the, you know, we think they need us more than they actually probably do. But, uh, you know, but one thing going back to the C-sections, totally. you can make your decisions mm -hmm. with section all before it becomes a salvage. Because when you have the word salvage, you're going to have much less results. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a lot more problem. Yeah. So with your breeder mentor, find out how far do we go before we go ahead and take an option to call a friend, get, get the vet on the horn. How far, you know, how long is it going to take you to get in there? Because yeah. like with Japanese yeah. chin, if they're in hard labor mm -hmm. and they're 90 minutes out and you don't see a puppy or if you see a bubble, You've got call the vet because you can be in there in an hour and you can still have live babies being born. If you wait till the next morning, you've got, you've got nothing alive being born and you're going to have a really hard 
trip for your mom. So the, that's really when you go to do your brief, find out there how far, where's our cutoff points? Because those are important things to know for each breed. 100%, 100% good information. Dale, we have a question for you from Emily. Hey, Emily, um, do you ever have a get a puppy back contract with one of your dogs from a co-owned bitch, something like that? For me personally, how do you do your, like, do you do co-ownership? Yeah. No, I have enough enemies. I don't need to lose I know the answer to this friends. Question. So I myself, if it's important for me to have a puppy out of it, I keep it. And I mean, and if it's important for me that it gets bred, I breed it. And if I let it go, and if they have a wonderful litter and I want to go buy a puppy from them and I have a good relationship with them, I will. But I don't insert myself mm -hmm. into other, other things because I find that maybe in some large breeds where you have dozens of them, you don't mind. But in toy breeds and breeds where you're having single digits in, by the time you get to color and sex, there just isn't enough to share. And, and it, it will, it just almost all of those hard feelings and problems because, and even though right at the time, everyone's willing to go burn their house down, no dog is worth fighting like that over, you know? So if it's really important to you to have a puppy, you just, then you just go ahead and do that. You keep that bitch, have the litter, yeah. but don't, don't tie yourself financially mm -hmm. because that's a that's a big contract that's buying a house contract because you've got you've got to figure all the health testing yeah. you've got to figure the stud choices how the puppies are sold you guys are equally bound as co-breeders for akc record keeping and all of that you are mm -hmm. equally bound and all of that comes back onto both of you so before you sign on the dotted line with someone else mm -hmm. you better like them way more than the dog and anybody I co-own a dog with, I would give that dog to them any day of the week. That's me. Right. Right. I I really actually agree with you, Dale. And again, this is where this is one of those things where I have transitioned over, you know, my years as a dog breeder. And I think that we can probably both think of things that we used to do that we don't do anymore. Right. <laughs> um and, and honestly, co-ownerships are one of them. Um, I, I seriously, I mean, I've done it. I've lived through it. I've survived it. I've, I've had some really amazing co-ownerships and some really hideous ones, but I'm to the point now, like you, I'm like, if I'm co-owning this dog with someone, it means I don't trust them exactly to me. And if I don't trust them, I'm not going to sell them a dog. It's that easy. <laughs> easy breeze. Yeah, it's just never, it's never clean. Yeah. Because there's so many variables in the, especially talking about showing, breeding, whelping, when, how, what there is. It's just, it's, I, the times I hear of it ever going really well, is just not someone always feels a little put upon and uh i know myself one of my first bitches yep. i purchased and i paid money i didn't have for it and she was a horrible mother and i raised mm -hmm. one puppy and i had to give it back and the people let it get run over like a week or two later after i gave my one puppy that we raised with a bottle from the first day <laughs> I was like, I need therapy now. I'm never going to recover from this. You know, I have a yeah. extreme. Yeah, uh, that's definitely <laughs> therapy. Jesus. Yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Yeah. Okay. All right, guys. Mother's Day doggy style. Anybody else out there in Facebook land have questions for us before we let you all move on with your nights? Anybody, anybody, anybody going once, going twice, Bueller. All right. All right, Dale. Thank you so much. This has been great. It's so good to see your face. I never get to see it's, you anymore. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. We'll have to, we'll have to do it again soon.
we will do it again. We will do it again. Thanks a lot, Dale. Everybody else, Thanks. peace out, y'all. Don't forget Happy Westminster Monday. Kennel Club's coming up. I will be there. Come find me. Are you going to be there, Dale? I'm judging somewhere else. They didn't ask me. Are you going <laughs> to? I'm not judging. Nobody asked me to judge at Westminster. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. No, I'm going to be hanging out at the um, Purina booth giving high fives and and uh, recording people to get their prizes. And I was invited to come. Actually, it is an incredible honor, and I'm so um, thrilled. I was invited to come up to the junior showmanship reception um, as one of the VIPs that the kids voted on. And I am just, I know, I'm dying. I was like, that is the sweetest damn thing I've ever heard. And I am like, in, I know, moved to tears, honored. So oh, I will be enough. back that's there and thing. I will see you. Absolutely. Dale, thank you so much. Everybody, peace out. Have a great night, you guys. Bye-bye.